Our very own David Weston, the host of Wall Street Week, went down to Washington and he had a chance to sit down with the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. A fireside chat at the Aspen Security Forum in Washington where they covered a wide range of issues. Let's take a listen. We're starting to realize that the implications of a regulatory system that um, uh, started in the 90s and hasn't evolved very far is creating disconnects with uh, the, the implications of this technology advancement. So I'll give you one very, very specific example that I think may resonate with a lot of people because it's a large part of the conversation in so many ways. The unveiling of ChatGPT4 in the spring I think was a wake up moment for all of us that, wow, there is a lot of innovation that's going on in our economy. That is a great thing, but holy Jesus, <laughs> uh, what is happening here? And I would just say that even, a, um, even five years ago, um, I had the opportunity to participate in a conference at Stanford where they did a whole AI presentation for us. And at the time, the prompts that you were giving AI were coming out with hilariously funny outcomes. When you ask AI that was being trained to write a joke, and uh, the joke that came out the back end was almost never funny, or it was funny because it was so unfunny, right? So at the time, I think just five years ago, 2019, 2018, we're thinking, wow, this uh, could have a lot of potential. There's so much innovation. There's so much uh, stuff that's brewing. Um, but we don't have to be worried about it yet because it's still very rudimentary. Short period of time, all of a sudden, for all of you who have experimented with ChatGPT4 and you started putting prompts in, it's literally blowing everybody's minds, right? Which is the focus that we have now on AI. What is AI built on? <clears throat> it's built on massive amounts of data. We come back to the issue of data. Mm -hmm. How do you develop AI? You have to have access not just to those massive amounts of data, you have to have access to incredibly powerful uh, computing processes. You marry those two up and you're going to push that innovation and push that development. Who has access to that kind of data and that kind of computing power? A very small number of extremely powerful and dominant companies that are almost all, if not all, American. And that's why our posture on the rules that apply to data flows, data localization, and source code is so important. At the core of each of these proposals in these negotiations is um, the question that we have to answer around the balance of authority between the private sector and the companies and the government and our regulatory authorities. Who gets to decide or control how freely the data can flow and when it can be restricted, where it needs to be stored, and when access is required to disclose source code. Uh, and I think that those issues are very much consequential, not just for trade and economics, but for our entire society. And the cross-cutting nature of these issues means that if we're going to lead using trade rules at a time when there is no consensus but massive amounts of debate and questioning, then I, as USTR, am committing massive malpractice and uh, probably committing uh, policy suicide by getting out ahead of all of the other conversations and decisions that we need to make as a country. Uh, on the subject of expanding existing agreements, uh, we had, I believe it's your counterpart in Taiwan this week, say, we'd like to have a free trade agreement. Let's expand out what we have right now. Obviously, that would raise geopolitical issues, foreign policy issues. Uh, are you open to that? So the negotiation we're having with Taiwan right now, and I'll just highlight here, um, every trade negotiation we're doing right now um, has an element of innovation that's baked into it. Mm -hmm. And this is because we're trying to be responsive to the data and the feedback that we are receiving from the world economy. There are so many changes that are going on simultaneously that I have not met even our smartest economists, um, even my colleague Janet Yellen, who is a legend in macroeconomics, no one can explain exactly what's happening or predict exactly what's going to happen next. And so from a trade policy perspective, what we have been very disciplined in trying to do is to say, let us bring a trade uh, program to each one of our partners mm -hmm. that's tailored to that partner, that's tailored to their interest and our interest in the partnership, that's also tailored to the challenges and the dynamics that we are um, navigating together in the global economy. 
With Taiwan, what that's meant is that we have been negotiating uh, agreements, uh, and um, the first agreement that's, um, uh, that we have with Taiwan is one that covers, I think, um, five issue areas. Um, it's uh, trade facilitation, it's small medium enterprises, good regulatory practices, um, and um, uh, oh, you probably I'll have to look at my notes for the other two, but we've got a core group of uh, five disciplines. Uh, we signed that agreement. Um, Congress, uh, in a fit of um, enthusiasm, even though they weren't legally required to, uh, took a vote on it uh, to show their support for what we are doing here. And on the basis of that support, we are negotiating another set of disciplines uh, right as we speak. We've been making excellent progress, and we will continue to look at building out uh, those agreements uh, to, to have an arrangement with the Taiwan economy that is fit for the times. And the times are very challenging. And so this is one of our accomplishments that we are particularly proud of and committed to. So you don't rule out a free trade agreement, but it's not now. Look, so let me let me back up to um, what, what, what do you mean by a free trade agreement, <laughs> right? Do you mean the traditional kind of U.S. approach to a uh, very, very comprehensive, maximally liberalizing, aggressively liberalizing agreement? We're not doing that with anybody right now. Um, it's actually insensitive to the dynamics in the global economy and the U.S. economy right now to push on with that program, which may have been fit for the 80s and the 90s. Maybe it was starting to show its age in the 2000s and 2010s. It's 2023. We need new policies. There's innovation going on all around us. When we were negotiating those agreements, um, I don't know, AI wasn't even a thing that we talked about, right? So in, in all these different ways, but certainly we hadn't experienced the pandemic supply chain discombobulations and disconnect, the fragilities, the geopolitical tensions where we've always had them, but they were different and at a different scale with different partners. So in all ways, uh, as much as we embrace innovation instinctively as Americans and certainly in our economy, um, we need to be embracing innovation in our trade policy, and that's what we're doing. And that's why when you say FTA, sure, if by FTA you mean are we innovating trade agreements and are we doing trade um, uh, aggressively but in new ways? Yes. When you say FTA, if you mean the old style trade agreements that we used to do, then no.